It is the late 1930s and the world is in turmoil. Humanity is on the brink of war as imperialist nations in the Far East and Europe work aggressively to expand their domination. The Nazis have taken control of Germany and now spread darkness around the globe in their hunt for powerful occult artifacts that can give them the upper hand in the days to come. But the spirit of adventure and freedom won't be stamped out so easily. Heroic adventurers from around the world answer the call, racing against time to hunt down ancient artifacts, explore deadly temples, and fight back the powers of darkness from engulfing the world. It is a race of good versus evil, and only a cunning and agile explorer can claim the ultimate prize of fortune and glory. Hi everyone, I'm Tom, and today we're going to be playing that, Fortune and Glory. It's a cliffhanger pulp movie kind of game where we are going to be going around the world adventuring, trying to find artifacts and stop them getting in the hands of the vile organization we are playing against in our particular game. It can be played competitively, cooperatively, playing it cooperatively. Well, solo really, but yeah, you can imagine this would be a three player game. We've got three explorers, three heroes that are gonna be trying to scour the world for these precious things to keep them out of the hands of the vile organization in this game, the mob. So there are three vile organizations across the, the base game and a couple of expansions. There's the mob, there is Nazis, and there is the Order of the Crimson Hand. They've all got their own ways of playing, their own special rules, their own events that can happen and all of that kind of stuff. They are on the board too. They are gonna be looking out for these artifacts and trying to get the most fortune. It's a race really. We as players need, as a team, 10 fortune each so 30 fortune between us will win us the game fortune are these uh, gold plastic coins along the way we also hope to earn glory which you know is our reputation that will make people give us things and cause allies to follow us at the same time the villains will hunt for artifacts and they will accumulate fortune in various ways and move up this villain track in a three hero game if they reach 16 on the villain track we lose before we get started i recommend you turn on the subtitles to the klingon channel any mistakes i make will be corrected there thanks steve and if you'd like to help support the channel and keep playthroughs like this coming uh, then there are links to patreon and ko-fi in the description uh, every little helps your support will be massively appreciated in uh, making all of this happen Thanks everyone that does. So let's have a look at our heroes. We have Shelley Hargrove, the race car driver. A race car driver by trade, Shelley Hargrove lives a fast life. The rush of competition and the thrill of the chase carries over into everything she does. And in a man's world, she can stand toe to toe with the best of them. Though young and small of size, Shelley makes up for it with her spunky attitude and carefree willingness to dive headlong into danger. In her mind, if you're not moments from death, you're not truly alive. She's got a car, so she will move more every turn. She gets extra dice when she she's being chased and she can pay glory to heal her wounds as long as she's not in the middle of a fight that's good because she doesn't have that many she's only got four wounds she's got a bit of defense that will help her out when she takes damage and she's got some decent stats there just threes for combat and cunning four for agility so that's her best thing and law is her worst thing just two on that everybody gets the choice of two personal missions to start with and they keep one Shelly is looking to do some research on fate artifacts so she wants to recover an artifact with that fate symbol on it and if we look at the artifacts that we have got available in the world at the moment the heart of the damned over here has got that fate symbol so maybe that is what Shelley would like to go for we have Sharon Hunter the daring photographer hailing from the big city Sharon Hunter has set out from New York to photograph the exotic parts of the world unknown with a spirit of adventure and an artful eye she is tenacious in her quest to capture the great American tale and to find her own sense of heroics but she may have gotten more than she bargained for as she comes to realize there is real evil in the world and a need for real heroes to stand against the darkness. Sharon has contacts. She starts the game with an ally and randomly drawn from the deck that happens to be Dutch, a military sidekick. Gives her extra wounds, which is pretty impressive because she starts off with seven wounds, the most out of any of our heroes that we're playing right now. So she's got nine wounds effectively while Dutch is on board and he gives her plus two to a combat, which is already pretty decent. She's got threes for everything. Uh, so five combat while she's got Dutch on board. You can only have one sidekick and his loyalty value is three, but all of Sharon's allies have plus one to that. That might be called into question as people like the mob start uh, throwing money at your allies to try and dissuade them from helping you out. And her personal mission is noble pursuits. She wants to sell an artifact in a minor city. Once we get the artifacts, we can go and sell them in cities. You want to go to major cities because you'll get more fortune for it and that's our win condition. But 
but uh, yeah, if you're a bit selfless and you go to a minor city, which to be honest, you might want to do anyway because they might be closer to you, then she will fulfill her personal mission. Finally, we have Grant Jackson, the soldier of fortune. A rough and tumble adventurer, Grant Jackson has spent the last eight years as a mercenary, working in the most inhospitable deserts and jungles on Earth. He has helped liberate war-torn cities in the sands of the Sahara and track down exotic creatures terrorizing the local villages in the outback. Trained in the US Army and the School of Hard Knocks, he has finally come to the realization that sometimes it's better to do the right thing than to make a buck. Of course, that doesn't stop him from trying to do both. He is a mercenary and starts the game with a gear because of that. Uh, he's got a Tommy gun, which is going to really help him out in combat. So you've got two players pretty good at combat starting out. So he, he's got four combat to begin with anyway. So really, really good there. He's not so cunning and he's pretty average at uh, agility and lore. He gets extra adventure dice if he's in the jungle or the desert. And his personal mission, taking care of business, he wants to defeat a mob enemy in combat for some extra fortune as well. So really want to get that done. In Fortune and Glory, we are going to be Indiana Jonesing around the world, trying to recover these artifacts and put them in museums and that before the vile organization can do the same. So a couple of things about the game. We have got expansions in this. It is long out of print, unfortunately. You can still get copies coming up. The expansions may be less so. Expansions add you know, a lot more cards to the deck, some more heroes. I think the Crimson Hand vile organization were an extra thing. So there is plenty in just the base game, but you might see things that don't appear outside of the expansions. I got a copy secondhand that included them and the figures had already been painted, which is a plus into it. The rule books for all of the things have been neatened up and made comprehensible and all lovely uh, by users on BoardGameGeek who have made this complete compendium, this complete rule book of all of the things. Uh, it includes you know, the separate rule books, any FAQs, erratas, things that have been answered in the forums, and where no answers were found in all of that, uh, they've you know, made some rules to fill the gaps. So good on them. Thanks everyone for doing that. And there are some fantastic things like flowcharts and you might, you've already seen it actually, the villain board here. It's not essential, but for remembering certain things like which villain is doing what and how much fortune have they got, how, how close are they to having three, which symbols have they got available. Just a really nice thing to just print out and have. So without going into the flowcharty bits, what happens in a round of fortune and glory? First of all, we have the initiative phase and expect plenty of story and adventuring, but also plenty of dice. Each hero rolls a die and that's going to be their initiative for the turn. Highest roll is going to be the first player for the round, and we do the other phases in clockwise order. And then anyone that rolls a one for this initiative gets an event card, which could be good, could be bad. So let's do Shelley rolls a three, Sharon rolls a one, and Grant rolls a two. So Shelley is going to be our first player. This is the first player token. A bit big, but we can manage it. And so Sharon draws an event card. And let's see what she has found. Call in a favor. Play on any hero to allow them to immediately draw an allies card or play to give an ally plus two loyalty until the end of the game round. Now, this could be quite a good thing to do, you know. Now, unless it says otherwise, if it says play immediately, you've got to play it immediately. If it says you've got to play it at a certain time, you've got to play it at a certain time. But generally, they can be played at any time outside of other players' turns whenever you want, really. So I think to even things up, everyone else has started with something. Why not get Shelly an ally? So... Sharon is going to play that and Shelley can start with an ally and coming to join her is an occult expert. This is an immobile ally, so he's not traveling the world with Shelley. He's in San Francisco. This might matter for certain effects, just like all of these keywords we can see everywhere. They don't matter now, but they might for certain things. He's got an activate ability. This is something that can just be used once per round. Uh, she can add three adventure dice to a single test while she's at a myth or a magic adventure. Doesn't help for the one that she wants to do first, but could help out later. The thing is, when we are playing against the mob, there is a special rule for allies. When you want to use an activate ability, you've got to first make a loyalty four plus test. And we're gonna see a lot of stuff about tests. The skill value that you have, so, they, so the cult expert has loyalty two. That means they would roll two dice for this test. Four plus means they would need fours. So when we want to activate this ability, we've got to do that loyalty test. That's why it's good that Sharon adds loyalty for her own allies. If it's passed, the ability works as normal. If it's failed, 
Not only do you not do the ability, you discard the ally to represent being kidnapped or bumped off by the mob. So a bit of risk with allies then. So we've had the initiative phase, then we have the movement phase, and yes, this is a roll to move game. We are going to roll dice to determine how far we can go. So Shelley wants to find the heart of the dam. So we've got these four artifacts here, and you can see the different coloured skulls on them correspond to the skulls that are out on the board. So the heart of the dam the one with the fate symbol that Shelley wants to go and find is out here in the Sahara so not very far away one thing that we want to worry about one villain that started out in the world is Vanessa Love out here she's at the most valuable artifact this temple here the city of power so someone might want to get down to the devil's reach space to try and stop her from just getting a load of fortune for the mob. Let's see how far we move. So Shelly rolls a five. That's great. Way more than she needs. Sharon rolls a two. And you can do it all one at a time if you like. And decide where you're going. We just tend to roll together. So five, two, three. Shelly goes first because she's got to be the first player. So we know where Shelly wants to go. She's going to go to the Sahara. Now spaces on the board are divided up with these black lines. So to move from space to space it's a point of movement. You do start off in a city. They're covered up a little bit by these docks tokens. And I think Marty's been giving Shelley a bit of a, a kick around because she's not in Paris where she's meant to be. So to go from the city to the Western Europe space is a movement. To go from the land to the sea, each of the ocean spaces have a movement value in them. That's how much you've got to spend to get into that space. There are some exceptions with certain islands, like say the British Isles. That's just a space and you can imagine there's no water between here. It's just one space to go from the British Isles to Western Europe. She wants to go to the Sahara though, so she can spend one of her, well, six movements. She's rolled five on the dice. Remember, she's got the car that adds one to it all. One movement to get out of Paris and into Western Europe. It's two to then get into the Mediterranean. So three altogether, and then one more to get into the Sahara. And Shelley is just going to go right for it and go for the heart of the damned in the adventure phase. Sharon just rolled a two. Now, if you roll a one in the movement phase, you also get an event card. So you can potentially get two a turn if you roll really badly. Two doesn't quite get her to the Caribbean, or she could start making her way over the Devil's Reach. But I think she's just going to stay where she is in New York and maybe have some kind of event in there. Finally, Grant rolled a three. He's in Cape Town. I think he's going to go and try and make things difficult for old Vanessa Love over here. Do you know what? Cape Town being a dock city with three movement, I think he can get to the temple out here because it's two movements straight out onto the sea. One more movement onto the Devil's Reach and a bit of a crowded space, especially when we've got to be lying down for bird's eye things. Hey, look, a temple. So yeah, we're not particularly tooled up right now, but yeah, let's start having adventures. So now we have the adventure phase and the adventure we're going to be having is Shelley Hargrove and the Heart of the Damned. So artifacts are worth an amount of fortune. They can be worth more if they are put in deep jungles, but they're also harder to find. They have various attributes that you might care about, say if you've got a personal mission that wants you to find a fate artifact like Shelley has. They've got a danger value. This is how many dangers you need to overcome to find this artifact, and they might have some special text. Unfortunately, this artifact is cursed, and every time we do a danger, we've got a 50-50 chance of taking a wound. That's not very good for a character that can't take many wounds, but we can start to see dangers and stuff. So we draw from the bottom of the dangers deck, so on her way to this artifact, searching for it in the Sahara. Maybe it's a mirage, but Shelley has had a nightclub rendezvous. So remember, there's more keywords. Shelley has quick reflexes and so is good in chase tests. No chase in this nightclub rendezvous. And it might be a bit of a toughie. So it's worth two glory. You get that if you succeed, but not straight away. We'll see that afterwards. Discover the truth as you pick your way through the crowded nightclub to meet with your contact. Cunning six plus and then this X here. So this is a success. So we've kind of seen in the, the loyalty test example, cunning means you're going to use your cunning value. Shelley's is three, nothing else to boost that. So she is going to roll three dice. It's not a myth or a magic adventure. So unfortunately the occult expert is not going to be any help. So she's going to roll three dice. This tells us we need sixes to count as successes and she needs one success. She's got nothing that allows her to boost this in any way. She's just got to try and find a six on these dice and just uh, really cross her fingers, I suppose. Let's have a look. 
and she gets two sixes. So she has succeeded at her nightclub rendezvous. If you fail, all of these danger cards on the other side, this is why we draw from the bottom of the deck, have got a cliffhanger, which tell you how your next turn is going to start. You can't move on your next turn. You've got to resolve the cliffhanger. As it is, we succeeded though. So now Shelly collects a danger. She's got one of the three that she needs to find the heart of the damned. We also need to do the little curse. Roll a die on a one, two or three. She takes a wound, one of her four. It's a one. So unfortunately, that means she is going to take a wound. It's OK. She's got three more. And remember, if she can get some glory from things, she can pay glory to heal those wounds. So we've finished with that danger. You've now got a choice after you've succeeded. Do you want to press on? If you press on, you do another danger and resolve it in the same way. If you succeed at that, you can keep pressing on until you've got the artifact or you can camp down. If you camp down, you fully heal. You collect the glory from everything you've succeeded at so far. And that's the end of your turn. So you're delaying getting the artifact, but you're healing back up and banking the glory. It's only a couple of glory so far. You do keep the danger either way. So if you press on and fail, it's not like you lose everything. You just don't get the glory and the opportunity to heal. You can also heal by going to cities and paying glory to do it. I think Shelley's going to press on and hope that she gets in some kind of chase. So after the nightclub rendezvous, she is going to stow away on a cargo ship looking for the heart of the damned. Unfortunately, it's not a chase. Danger, water, sneak. It's with three glory. Wait until no one is looking and slip by in the shadows or disguise yourself as a dock worker to get aboard and hope they don't ask questions. So we can do an agility check needing four or better. We need four successes on those checks or cunning, which we've just seen is three dice. We need fives or more and we only need two successes. I think let's go for agility. So Shelly's got four agility. She gets to roll four dice because usually, unless we're doing deadly tests and we're not right now, it's not just about one roll. So she gets to do the roll. She needs fours or better. And she got one out of the four. So she gets a success towards the four that she needs. As long as you rolled a single success in your roll, you get to roll again and keep going until you've either succeeded or rolled no successes. So she can roll again on that and she gets better this time, a couple more. So that's three towards the four that she needs. And then one more roll and a oh, bit risky there. I only got one again, but that's the four that she needed. So she has succeeded. She can get her second danger. She needs to roll to see if the curse wounds her again. One, two or three, it wounds. So unfortunately, that's the second for Shelley there. So it is tempting now. She would bank five glory and heal both those wounds if she just waits a minute. But the temptation, one more danger. And that's an artifact grabbed turn one which is always really, really tempting. And we know from the story, Shelley wants to live life on the edge. She's not going to camp down. She's going to press on. And she has found an ancient trap. Fortunately, not a chase again. Another two glory. The walls here are lined with grotesque stone faces. As you proceed down the hall, you must draw on your knowledge of the ancient culture to determine which are traps to avoid and where it is safe to move. As we saw at the start, Shelley is not great at law. She has got two dice to roll on this. She only needs fours and she only needs three successes. But yeah, this is going to be the trickiest one yet. Let's see if she can manage it. So four or better. There's one. So that's one of the three successes she needs. And she can go again. Four or more. Unfortunately not. There is nothing that she can do about this. There is exertion that you can do when you're trying to escape temples and you are facing a cliffhanger. But for now, the right move was definitely to camp down on that second one. So all that glory has got to be taken away. The two successful dangers stay with her. And we can flip this over because after failing to work out which were traps and which were not, Shelley finds herself in a room filling with sand. And she's going to have to have a special check at the start of next turn. Sharon is in a city. First thing she has to do, unless you're on a cliffhanger, of course, is resolve a city card. And she has found a secret delivery. So if we were playing multiplayer and we were competing to, to race to, I think it's 15 fortune, uh, you can keep cards like this a secret, anything with an exclamation mark in it. But 
several friends here, you have been given a secret package to deliver to Chicago. Discard while in the named city during your adventure phase to gain D6 fortune. Well, fortune's the thing we want. That's pretty great. She's only a couple of spaces away from Chicago. Downside is that's where the mob HQ is. She might have to do some fighting there, but she does have Dutch to help her with that fighting. After resolving the city card, if it's got a docks token there, you may resolve it. You don't have to. The docks tokens can be good things, can be bad things, but let's have a look at what one is. So in the docks at New York, she has found a fortune. Now, sometimes it's been that you've got to fight somebody, uh, you can travel anywhere in the world. In this case, it is just a single fortune. So if the, the tokens, the small ones are ones and the big ones are fives, Sharon has found the first fortune of the game and we only need 29 more and the villain track's still at zero, which is pretty great. The dock token doesn't refill yet. The downside of staying in the city is everything else that you can do heal wounds she's fully healed and the reason that she can't get items or allies as well is you need glory to spend for that she hasn't got any of it so she can't do anything else here but it's better than just moving out of space she could have gone straight to chicago now we know what that city card was that would have been pretty great she could have resolved it immediately but maybe she'll go there next time and uh, fight the mob and now it's time for grant jackson and the city of power which is a temple adventure now, this is where we need to have a look at Vanessa Love. The most important thing right now is her ability. Her sabotage ability tells us that heroes in her space need an extra success on any test. So that is not great for Grant, but hopefully he can get in Vanessa's way a little bit as well. Now, if the villain's there, your first danger just happens as normal, but for every subsequent press on you want to do you have got to try and sneak past the villain there you know you're both in the temple at the same time you you don't quite know where the other one is they're kind of looking for you but they're also looking for the artifact and temples work a little bit differently to normal dangers you don't just succeed at five and get the thing uh, they've got 10 fortune on them well, however many fortune the card says, this one has 10. And for every danger you succeed at, you'll get one of the fortune off it. You take the last fortune off it, you get the card that you can then go and sell at a city. So, going towards this temple, Grant has had a cargo plane mishap. Something's not right. Your flight has been sabotaged. Find a way out of this mid-air predicament. Cunning, six plus, one success. Although, because Vanessa is there, he's going to need two. Grant's... Cunning is only two. Oh, actually, we can see it all from Grant's screen, can't we? So he's only got the two dice. As long as he gets one six, he can carry on and have another shot. Let's have a look. He gets no sixes, so straight away, that's pretty bad. This might not have been the great thing for Grant to do, but you've got to try. It's not a great thing because failing is a bit worse in a temple. Temples aren't the most stable things. Ancient temples, when you're raiding around them for artifacts. And so every time you succeed at a danger, you pop a danger token on here. And when there's five, the number in the danger value, those danger tokens convert to a collapse token. And you've got to roll to see if you escape. Failing and causing a cliffhanger immediately puts a collapse token on there. So Grant, having a cargo plane mishap, has realized that there are no parachutes, and that's the cliffhanger we're gonna have to leave him in. There is one collapse token here, which means he needs to roll one die. If he rolls a one, this temple is collapsing, which actually would stop Vanessa getting stuff from it, so maybe that's not terrible. Uh, so let's have a look. He rolls a five, the temple does not collapse. In the future, when another collapse token is put there, we need to roll two dice to see if we roll a one on any of them and the temple collapses. We're okay for now though. Unfortunately, it could have gone better, but maybe you can still get in the way of Vanessa there. We've now all had our turns, so it's time for the villain phase. For that, we start out with the villain event cards. We draw one and do what it says. So we have found dark powers. This card plays on the table. When the villains have at least one artifact that is myth, any hero in the same space as a villain will roll one less adventure dice on any tests they take. That's not ideal to come out early, is it? They haven't found a myth one yet. The orb of Loki fits that description, though, so someone might want to race over to the Alps and try and get that before the mob do. Then we have the outpost step, and each of the vile organisations in the game have got some big, thick cards telling you about their general special abilities, some special events that might trigger from their villain event cards, and what their HQ and hideouts do. So the HQ starts first. There can only ever be one HQ out, but there can be multiple 
outposts, hideouts. It always starts in Chicago. If it's ever destroyed, it will be placed back on the board in a random city in the end phase. That's the one after the villain phase. During the outpost step, that's now. Roll a d6 for the mob HQ. Generally villains, roll green. Three. On a roll of four, five, or six, place a mobster thug figure in a random city. Hey, we didn't roll a four, five, or six, so that's okay. If there is already one there, move the villain track a step forward. So maybe lucky on that. Then we have a hideout that was placed in a random city. That's supposed to be in Moscow, rather than Russia. During the outpost step, each hideout on the board generates a fortune for the villains through its illegal operations of money laundering and racketeering. So a fortune goes over to the villains. Now they've got these three fortune spaces on their board here because for every time they get three fortune, they move up a space on their villain track. So they're a third of the way of moving one space. We can also go and attack their hideouts and headquarters. We're not doing that just yet. And finally, the villains are going to adventure. So starting with Vanessa Love, who is out on the board. She's not in the deep jungle, so she hasn't got to discover the artifact's location. Her search value is four. That's how many dice she's going to roll to search for this artifact. For every four, five, or six, she is going to collect a fortune from this temple. For every one she rolls, she will take a wound, ignoring her defense. So let's see what she's going to end up with. And she has got two fortune and one wound. So I'll pop the wound on her there. She's got four more. And the third fortune there is going to cause those to be taken off. And we move the villain track up to one when it gets to 16 it's all over for every success they had they also pop a danger on the temple and so remember that is working towards the next collapse three more dangers that are placed on will cause an extra collapse that's the end of vanessa's turn mickey the hammer is the other villain that was randomly drawn for this game out of the mob villains and they don't start out on the board they start out ready a ready villain is going to go out onto the artifact with the highest fortune with no other villain on it so out of the others we've got one that's worth three four and five so the axe of the dark void out here in the caribbean is going to be mickey the hammer's target and that's the end of mickey's turn that's also the last villain that's out so the villain phase is over finally we have the end phase if we've got acolytes on any adventures they will get some successes and help the vile organization I haven't seen those yet. We check for victory. So this is an important thing for the end of the game. We need 30 fortune, but that doesn't just immediately end the game. You've still got to go through the villain phase. And there's actually a bit more to win. You need 30 fortune and everyone needs to be on a starting city, not necessarily their starting city, but someone's starting city. So this point, we check for victory. We haven't achieved it. We replenish artifacts if any had been found or maybe temples have collapsed. Heroes get back up if they have been KO'd and the mob HQ would now be placed out again. That's the end of the end phase. So we can go back to a new round, the initiative phase. Let's roll then. Shelly gets a one. So probably not going first, but we'll definitely get an event card. Sharon's got two and Grant has got a one. So Sharon is going to be our first player. Shelly gets bold action. Play on any hero, including yourself, to give them plus five adventure dice for one roll. Or play on any hero, including yourself, to give them plus three move this turn. And Grant has found fortune's favor. Play on any hero when they complete a danger. That hero may immediately fully heal and gains glory equal to the number of wounds healed in this way. That is pretty good, isn't it? good thing to play on Shelly. If she manages to succeed at a danger, she'll have a fair few wounds for doing it. Great thing to come out. Okay then, movement. Sharon is going to have six movement this time, but might still just go to Chicago. Grant is not going to have any movement. You still roll for it because if you roll a one, you'll get an event card. But if you're facing a cliffhanger like Shelly and Grant, you can't go anywhere because Shelly's trapped in a room full of sand. Grant's in a plane with no parachutes. So with that movement, is Shelly going to stick with a plan of going to Chicago or now Mickey the Hammer is as an artifact, is she going to try and steal it away from him? It only needs two dangers and then a fight and she might have to fight Mickey the Hammer who is, you know, he's got a great big truncheon kind of thing. He's pretty formidable. Now Sharon is well-traveled. It costs one less movement to enter any sea space and flying between cities costs less fortune. Now I haven't really covered flying between cities. You can pay fortune, so you can pay points to fly across the map generally you don't want to spend your points so i'm going to do that and she's got loads of movements so she can she doesn't even need to go to the sea if she doesn't want to uh, she can just go one 
two. Oh, she will have to go to the sea at this point, won't she? Three, four. However she does it, she can get to the Caribbean and she's going to have an artifact adventure when we get to that phase. Grant can't move. Shelly can't move. Okay, now we're in that phase. So we now have the adventure of Sharon Hunter and the Axe of the Dark Void, which has some special rules. After all the dangers, you must fight dark creatures to get the artifact. We have some kind of standard enemy cards that are you know, likely to come out across the game that you're playing. Dark creatures are you know, pretty, pretty nasty to fight. Not unbeatable though, nothing's unbeatable. So we need a danger, Sharon on the way to the Axe, is in a high-speed boat chase. Unfortunately, it's not our player that's really good at chases. They're getting away. You'll have to kick it into high gear if you hope to catch them. Agility 4+. plus. Okay, there is not much chance of this succeeding. So Sharon has three agility. I say that because this is a deadly test. These red X's mean you need these successes in one roll. Do you know what? This might be time for bold action. Shelly, even though she is up against a big cliffhanger test, is going to give Sharon five extra dice for one roll. Okay, can she do it? High speed boat chase. <gasps> Have we done it? Pause, yes. One, two, three, just enough. So thanks to Shelly Hargrove's bold action, Sharon has caught up with a boat. She's gonna press on, so she's got one of the dangers required for this. But yeah, surely Mickey is gonna get this when he searches. So, Sharon succeeded at the high-speed boat chase. She wants to press on, but if there is a villain there and you're pressing on, you've, you've got to do a sneak check. We look at Mickey's search, it's four. So he's gonna roll four dice in a minute. Sharon needs to pick a number, and if that number comes up, Every time that it came up, she's going to have to fight Mickey the Hammer, who's pretty formidable. So she is going to go with five and try not to roll it. And she doesn't, so she can press on. So she has found herself in an occult ritual and she has a choice to make. She can do another agility test. She needs three successes. It's a deadly test, though. and She's not that great at agility. She can do a law check. She needs fives on that, but only two of them and she can re-roll. That test isn't deadly. Or she can fight the Order of the Crimson Hand, which I think she's going to do. Now, she is going to have to fight in a minute. I was tempting not to, but yeah, if she takes a loads of wounds from this, then Grant could play this card on her instead of Shelly and heal her back up for a fight in a minute, because this fight replaces this danger, essentially. The danger is succeeded if you defeat the Order of the Crimson Hand, and you get the glory on the thing you fought rather than the danger. So, how do fights work? Well, your combat ability is how many dice you're going to roll. So for Sharon, that is three, four, five. So we need five white dice. That's Sharon's fighting ability. And the Order of the Crimson Hand gets two. They are green dice. We roll the big bunch of dice. Fours, fives, and sixes are hits. Anything else is misses. And uh, the Order of the Crimson Hand have got four wounds. And they get stronger for every wound they take. So if you can finish them off quickly, that would be fantastic. So out of that, the Order of the Crimson Hand take three wounds, unfortunately. You can try and escape from fights as well. And oh, they didn't roll any hits. That's good. So Sharon's got a lot of wounds. She's got seven 8, 9, but she's got no defense. Defense negates hits that you take. So if they had rolled 1, 4 and she had a defense, she would cancel that one out and not actually take a wound. So she can decide to try and escape. You do this test, so it's agility 5 plus, 2 successes. If you succeed, you've escaped from the fight. But if you fail, they still roll their combat dice against you. And then you've got to have another round. So I think we're going to continue. Unfortunately, this isn't the best thing to happen in a fight against the Order of the Crimson Hand because they get an extra die for every wound that they have taken. So they now roll five dice. So it's five each basically, isn't it? So yeah, I, they, they can't defeat Sharon. It, it's actually not that bad, is it? Once we've got the Fortune's Favor card in play, that kind of calms things down a bit. So hopefully she's rolled a hit. Yes, she's rolled two. She's also taking four hits. She's still got five health, but I think that's completing a danger. The, he the hero may immediately fully heal. So the four wounds she was about to take, I'm not even going to grab them. And she gains four glory instead. One, two, three, four. That's both of our amazing event cards just gone the turn that we got them though. So that will be four glory, 
plus four, that'll be a lovely eight glory in store. But because it's the Axe of the Dark Void, Sharon also needs to fight, where are they? The Dark Creatures before she can get the artifact. She has got her full nine wounds again, but it can be a bit rough. So she can try and escape. A lore check of five or more. It's a deadly check though. She, she needs, she's got three dice to roll. She would need two successes on them. I think she's just going to try and fight. It is five versus five on the dice right off the bat. They've only got three wounds, but they have got a defense. So they'll negate the first hit each round. Let's see how this goes. So she has got two sixes and they have, oh, they've rolled two hits as well. So those two hits with no defense go straight on to Sharon. And because they've got a defense, they only take one wound out of the two hits. And we're gonna try again. Here we go. And oh, this is plenty. Oh, so she is actually a bit, <laughs> a bit banged up about this. So they are, they are dead. They're taking four wounds. They've got two health left and one defense. That's fine. But Sharon is also taking one, two, three, four more wounds, which actually she's got six wounds. She's still got three health which is pretty impressive, really, isn't it? Which actually, that's going to be paid for a little bit, isn't it? Because that's seven glory for defeating the dark creatures. So Sharon has come out of that with 19 glory and the axe of the dark void. There is no room already for the stuff that she has. So she doesn't get any fortune yet, she has to go and take this to a city. I thought there was a cool way of like, it's not necessarily that you're going to sell these things, although the action is called selling them. I think the complete rulebook's got a good way of looking at the fortune and glory in the game, because it does seem sometimes like they should be the other way around, that, you know, fortune is money. You should be spending that to get items and to, um, allies and things. But yeah, so fortune is the victory resource you're just collecting it. It's not cash per se, but it's your hero's growing power that comes from having large financial resources at their disposal. Selling ancient artifacts provides the type of riches necessary to influence world power. So you're not actually just selling them for a few coins. You're donating them or selling them for an enormous amount or donating them to get influence and stuff. The glory is your fame and reputation. You're not spending money to get these items and things. You're like calling in favors. So Indiana Jones isn't paying allies to be with him. Uh, he's getting given things and people are going on adventures with him because he's Indy. He doesn't have to pay them. That's what the glory kind of is. So I think that's a, a good way of thinking about it. Now, another great benefit of this happening is that Mickey the Hammer, any villain that was present at the artifact you have now grabbed, uh, is placed back onto their board in a delayed state. So he's not even going to come back out onto the board until next round. And he's not going to start searching for things until the round after that. Okay, things are going great for Sharon, but last time we were with Grant, he was in a plane with no parachutes. And now it's time for the next installment of Grant Jackson and the City of Power. The controls are smashed and all of the parachutes are gone. This is not good. Wait till the plane is low and jump to the treacherous waters before the plane impacts. So an agility check of six or more, needing only one success. So let's see if he can do it. Okay, six. No, he did not manage to do it, but but you can exert yourself in cliffhanger checks like this is now, or if temples are collapsing. To exert yourself, you take a wound and roll an additional die. You can do this one by one. You can't KO yourself by exerting though. So he's just going to have to hope that in these up to five extra dice, he can roll a six. No, second wound. Can he roll a six? No. Wound number three. Come on, get off that plane, Grant. Wound number four. This is his very last chance. This is his fifth wound. You can't choose to KO yourself doing this. Oh, it was so close. I thought it was a six then, but it's not. So unfortunately, when you fail your cliffhanger, you are KO'd. You lie down. Usually your minis would be standing up, of course. Uh, let's just put a wound token on him to remind us that he is KO'd. When you are KO'd, you roll a die and you need to lose that amount in fortune, glory, gear cards and ally cards. He's only rolled a one, which would be fantastic if he had anything else. Unfortunately for Grant, his only thing, the fantastic Tommy gun, great thing to start with, Unfortunately, he didn't get to have a fight. He got into a plane crash almost immediately, and he has lost that now. He fully heals and goes back to his starting city of Cape Town, and he will get to rejoin the adventure next turn. Would have been nice if 
we haven't spent all the cards on Sharon, I suppose, but Sharon has got us an artifact. Shelley is still adventuring in the Sahara, but she is trapped in a room filling with sand. The doors are sealed and sand has begun to pour into the room from holes near the ceiling. Find some way to shut off the mechanism before you are buried alive. So a law check. Shelley has got two law. Shelley needs fours, but that might not be great. Cunning, she needs fives. Only two successes, but she would roll three dice for that. I think she is going to use her cunning. She can exert, well, she's got no glory, has she? So she can't use her, you know, heal at any time ability. So she has got one chance to exert if she doesn't get it at uh, a certain point in this. So let's have a look. She has rolled the two fives that she needs. Perfect. So for passing your cliffhanger, you get the glory on it and it gives you a danger. You can then check, is this enough danger? It actually is for the Heart of the Damned. So I would say that it says after completing each danger here, roll a d6. She didn't complete a danger, she completed a cliffhanger. So I'm not going to roll. Let me know in the comments if I'm wrong with that. Maybe she should get an extra wound. But she, either way, she has definitely recovered the Heart of the Damned. And she has completed her fate research, recovering a fate type artifact. From now on, gain plus two adventure dice on all tests while at a fate adventure. Brilliant. If they come up again, of course. She then gets the top personal mission from the deck. You only get to choose at the start. Trendsetter. Spend an adventure phase in each of the following cities, New York and Paris, for two fortune. Pretty good. So I think that went well for everyone but Grant. It's time for the villain phase. Let's have a look at the villain event. It is going to be Dark Rituals. This card plays on the table. When the villains have at least one artifact that is magic, roll a d6 at the start of every villain phase on a roll of 4, 5 or 6. Move the track a step forward. Okay, getting rid of that magic artifact needs to be our top priority because that's... Oh, that's a myth and a magic artifact. Oh, wow. Yeah, that would trigger both of the bad things. We don't want those to happen. In the outpost step, we roll a die for the HQ. It's a six, so we put a thug in a random city. There is a deck of location cards, and the city at the bottom of that card is Washington, D.C. And so a Blues Brother is going out into Washington. And then the hideouts each earn them a fortune, so they've got one fortune towards their next villain track step. Then the villains act. Vanessa goes first, but all Mickey's going to do is move to the ready spot so we can get him out of the way now vanessa still has a search of four so fours fives or sixes oh he would have needed an extra success on his cliffhanger anyway wouldn't he because of vanessa so oh vanessa does get a success so that is a fortune and the danger goes out into the temple so three towards its uh, five of its next collapse point and she got two ones so that's two more wounds going on her she's okay she's got five wounds defense doesn't count when she's not being fought she's you know taking wounds from you know exerting herself having her own adventures we don't quite know what adventures the villains are getting up to when they're going through these artifacts but they can get KO'd which would be great for us there is still seven fortune to be had out there on the city because the villains are the only people that have got any off there so we are not victorious yet. Replenish the artifacts. So the way we do these is there's an artifact deck and an adventure deck. Get a card from each and that tells you what we are hunting for. It's going to be the Shadow of the Monkey God. So it's only worth three fortune and it's got four danger. That's not a, a great way around. It has got myth. So we want we want it in our hands rather than the villain's hands it's only worth three though so actually that might work in our favor because they tend to go for the one that's worth the most while at this adventure your defense is reduced to zero and may not be increased we draw a location card to tell us where it is going so that is in the andes and that's pretty good for grant he gets plus one dice on anything in the jungle and the other artifact is going to be the hammer of the golden mummy and it's rumored to be located in south africa which could be even more convenient uh it's actually that's actually good for shelly to go and get she gets plus two dice when getting a fate adventure doesn't she she was going to go up to europe we'll find out okay so there we go there is the first couple of rounds the first introduction to fortune and glory we're going to carry on and see how all of this plays out sharon has the axe of the dark void shelly has the heart of the damned grant has not a lot. No parachutes for sure. But hopefully he's going to get into a fight with a mob enemy and do something. I mean, there's a treasure on his doorstep. Surely something's going to happen. But there are a lot of things ready to kick off when the villains do get their hands on some artifacts. So I hope you'll join me for part two. In the meantime, there are loads of other playthroughs. Hey, if you like loads of dice and story and stuff, 
How about Agents of Smirsh or Eldritch Horror? You can support the channel on Patreon or Ko-fi, that's linked in the description. And hey, you can like the video and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more too. Any of it would be great. Thank you so much for watching though, and I'll see you for the next game. Bye everyone.